It's Dr. Ellen Reamer, R-I-E-M-E-R. -E -E just to uh, advise the gallery, if everybody could uh, seal the monitors, please, and the media be advised of that. Dr. Reamer, I want to move through this. Yes. And Dr. Reamer, I don't know if I'm necessarily even going to put them up on the screen. I am going to show you some images. I know the jury has seen these. I don't want to belabor the point. And I want to move quickly. But just very quickly, you've been previously qualified as an expert in this trial in forensic pathology. Is that correct? Yes. And you've done how many autopsies? Remind the jury, please. Um, around 5,500. Since I was last here, I've done a few more. Uh, you actually conducted the autopsies of Paul and Maggie in this case? Yes, I did um, both of the autopsies at the request of the Colleton County Coroner who called MUSC Forensic Pathology requesting autopsies on two individuals that died under his jurisdiction. I was not asked by the prosecution to perform an autopsy. It was an independent autopsy. Your autopsy is independent. You're not hired by the prosecution or law enforcement or anything no, like that? No, it's just at the request of, of the coroner. All right. Uh, you've uh, had a chance to uh, hear the testimony of the pathologist for the defense that testified yesterday? Yes. All right. I want to ask you a couple of general questions and then move specifically to some of the conclusions that that individual reached. But uh, just very quickly, uh, uh, with uh, skin tags, can you tell me the reliability of that in determining directionality just as a general matter? Yeah, well, you know, we look at these things, but just like every other thing at, uh, you know, finding at the autopsy, we take it in, in the context. So sometimes skin tags support your, your findings, and sometimes they're not really so reliable. So, you know, skin tags don't tell you necessarily the direction of a wound, especially going through very soft tissue. All right. And I'm going to show you a couple of exhibits that have been previously introduced in this particular case. I'm going to try to be very careful with these. I'm going to show you what's been marked as exhibits, defense exhibits, 159, 160, and 161. And if you could uh, take those out and just tell me if you recognize those. And again, please be mindful of the direction in which uh, those images are presented. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Yes, I've seen these. All right. And what are those images of? They're, um, they're autopsy photographs of of Maggie. All right. You have heard the testimony of the defense pathologist who testified yesterday that the directionality of the injury uh, to the side of Maggie's head with the associated injury to the breast and the abrasion actually was coming from the top down as opposed, and I say top down as, a, as if somebody's standing upright, as opposed from going towards the bottom of the body up, correct? Yes, that's All right. right. And can you please uh, look at, at uh, the, the images that you have and explain to the jury your conclusions and why that defense pathologist is incorrect, and who didn't conduct the autopsy to begin with, why he's incorrect. Okay. Um, well, um, do you want me to show the photos? You, you can, and uh, let's just go ahead and put them up, up on the screen. So I'll take them. And if you, uh, if you could step down, please, if that's okay with your honor. First, uh, I'm going to show Defense Exhibit 160. Are we secure? We good? Yeah. All right. And that's Defense 160. And Dr. Reamer, if you can again uh, explain to me your specific findings and, and how they relate to the testimony from yesterday. Yes. So we have the abrasion um, on the left 
shoulder, clavicle area. And then we have an entrance defect in this left side of the face. We can see a hole there. It's a hole. And there was a defect in the left temporal lobe of the brain, which was included in my autopsy report, that could only have happened from that being an entrance wound. Okay. And uh, you mentioned during your testimony the concept of a diastatic fracture. Does that in any way relate to your conclusion uh, uh, in this regard? Yeah, well, a diastatic fracture is um, when there's a separation of um, skull bones along suture lines which form during, which solidify during childhood. And usually it takes a lot of intracranial pressure um, to fracture uh, a skull um, along the suture line. And does that relate to the conclusion that this had to be an entry run? Yeah, well, that, that's a finding. That doesn't um, prove that this is an entrance wound, but what I do, I have a path through the left temporal lobe, and um, there's, you know, that, and that, is the, that it was associated with the diastatic fracture um, because of the increased pressure. In the All right, and one of the things you're telling this jury is you, who actually. Objection yes. leading. Were you actually able to observe a hole associated with an injury wound when you physically performed this autopsy? Yes, I physically performed the autopsy, and the way I determine direction is I have a hole below the left ear, which went into the brain, and so that's not going to happen in the opposite direction. And I understand that people can look at pictures. Does not, that's like a two-dimensional view, but doing the autopsy makes certain information available to the pathologist that is not available to an individual not performing the autopsy. And I had that information in my report, which was not, um, you know, not, which was, I guess, over, overlooked. Or overlooked by the defense right. pathologist. Yes, I'm sure. All right. Um, I'm going to show you now Defense Exhibit 161. Um, and there was some testimony from the defense pathologist about uh, uh, trying to determine directionality from this particular image, and can you please yeah. tell the jury why that pathologist is wrong? All right. Well, you know, um, when we have um, tears of the skin, and this is a lot of tears of the subcutaneous tissue, especially in a very soft area of the body where there's a lot of fat, there's a lot of stretching, and um, it doesn't necessarily, we can move the, the tissue of the breast and sort of, you can even get the, the, the points to go into a different direction. This is, this is not very impressive. It's not even really worth observing any of the, um, any of the uh, um, skin tags. It's, it's really very nonspecific and I think he has a very good imagination for, um, in, in, for seeing that in this photo. And it's, you know, skin tags can be there. Sometimes they support your findings, sometimes they don't support, but they don't take the place of determining the path of the wound by actually following it through the body. I'll show you finally what's been marked as Defense 159. And is this also a representation sort of the hole that you determined and were able to physically observe as a entrance wound on the side of Maggie's head. Yes. Thank you. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, Paul. And uh, you heard the uh, defense pathologist uh, and their subsequent expert talk about there being uh, a contact wound to the top of Paul's head. Is that correct? That's what he said. All right. And you, of course, have already testified during your direct testimony that there is no way for this to be a contact wound, but now you have specific observations about the defense yes. conclusions. Well, you know, I'm, I didn't think it was necessary for me to point out every, every um, feature, physical feature of the wound that demonstrates that the entrance was to the top of the left shoulder and then went into the left side of the head before exiting the top of the head. Now, before we, I go on, I do want to say that I agree with the book that, you know, that keeps being brought up, that when there is a contact shotgun wound to the head, there's massive 
gas expansion within the cranial cavity, within the skull. And what that does, it doesn't just create a hole with some, you know, bones. This was, I understand this was like the most severe thing you have ever seen. And you probably can't imagine that the damage to the head could be any worse. But a contact shotgun wound to the head with the associated gas expansion to the skull would not have, you know, his face was basically intact. We would have had tears of the skin and his eyes would have been either um, displaced from the orbital bones. The orbital bones were intact. Anytime there's massive um, gas buildup within the cranial cavity from a contact shotgun wound to the head, which the book does say is when we have the worst gas expansion, we, the entire face, he would have not even had a face left I mean, it sounds, I know what you saw was awful, and it was absolutely awful, but the damage would have been a lot worse. He would have had, like, the sides of his head would have gone, and he would have had, you know, his entire face would have been split open, because there's no way all of that gas expansion could occur and not fra cause fractures of these delicate bones in the face. His forehead was even still there. So, you know, it's, I agree with the book that a contact shotgun wound would cause severe gas expansion and damage to the head. What we have here is not consistent with a sh contact shotgun wound to the head. The damage to the head would have been much worse even though this was already horrible. Okay, that being said, there uh, are photographs. Okay. Yep, yeah, and I'm gonna put up uh, what's already been admitted into evidence as state 486. And if you could, uh, Doctor, just talk a little bit about this image as it illustrates what you're talking about with the face. But also, if you could, we'll go ahead and talk about what you, what, with the face. And then I want to talk about the shoulder yeah. a little bit as well. There's no skin, like torn apart of his face. His eyes are still in their correct locations. You know, it's hard to imagine that, you know, anything could be worse than a hole at the top right side of the back of the head. But in my 20 plus years of experience doing autopsies and seeing contact, gun shot, contact shotgun wounds to the head, which are associated with massive gas expansion in the skull, this entire face, he would have had tears, the you know eyes would have been either hanging down or lost, blown out. Um, there's no way that this, these features are consistent with a contact shotgun wound to the head. All right. Now, there's been some, there was some discussion by the defense pathologist about shaving the top of the head for stippling or checking for stippling. And can you comment on the necessity of that in your actual autopsy that you conducted? Okay. Uh, so, you room? know, he also said that um, sometimes we actually don't see the soot. Like he said, oh, if, if Dr. Lima shaved there, she would have had the opportunity to see the soot. So suppose I didn't see soot, or I did see soot. There is, there, first of all, I'm confident there was, there would not have been soot because the, this, the features of this wound are not consistent with a shotgun wound to that location. First of all, the damage to the head and face would have been far more severe than it was, and then also the wounds to the shoulder and left side of the cheek have all the features of entrance wounds. All right, and. One of the, uh, the things discussed by the defense uh, experts was sort of the, the large sort of oblong shape of the shoulder. Can you explain how that does not contradict your findings of that shot coming this way that we yes. see this injury here? And I'm going to actually put up uh, defense exhibit 162 to, to okay. illustrate uh, what we're talking about. All right. Well, um, you know, so we've got basically an oblong wound here. And that's because the, the wound is entering at an angle along the top of the shoulder. It's not hitting the shoulder at a perpendicular angle. So we, it kind of grazing along the top of the shoulder. Okay, now is this, um, okay. So, and actually, um, you know, he did say, he said that the, the pellets are going down. Okay, well, if you look at it as an entrance wound, they're actually going up. So it depends what you look, where you're looking at it from. If he's thinking that this is an exit wound, that this is, you know, where that the end of the wound path, um, then it would look to him as if the pellets are going down. 
but we can see this is actually an entrance wound for a few reasons. First of all, if it were an exit wound, do you remember all those pellet exit wounds on um, Paul's left arm that came from the chest? The pellets are not just going to stop in the shoulder. There's like no resistance there. The pellets are going to continue going until they exit the left side of the arm. Okay, so they don't just stop there. The reason they're there is that's because they started there. Okay? In addition, you see all of this, this white material here on the, on the edge of the entrance wound. That's styrofoam packing material that's between the pellets. You know, so the pellets are contained within wadding and um, the, there's styrofoam packing material between. And that would never have been deposited there. So I did not think it was net when I was telling you the direction, my determination of the direction of this wound. I did not have to necessarily, I was my, you know, my expert, um, I'm, I'm an expert at determining, at we, forensic, at forensic pathology includes establishing the direction of wounds. And because of all of these things, this was my determination. Okay, now there's another feature of this, this photograph. Do you see that this, this is coming into the left side of the, uh, this, is, this is what I determined, left side of the cheek, and we've got all sorts of abrasions around here. Now it doesn't have the classic, you know, what we saw on Paul's chest had that, those little petals, so we knew that the um, wanding was starting to open up. But in this case, there was wadding that was probably open as well. So we have, um, we have some pellets already starting to come out. You know, they're not, it's not entering within the wadding, but the wadding is going along and entering them. And we have all this abrasion around the left side of the, the, chin, the, chin, the chin neck area. And that's consistent with, we don't, we're not going to have that abrasion if it's coming out. It's going to push the skin out. We're not going to have an abrasion. So, you know, all that we've, and, you know, but even just common sense, we have that styrofoam packing material on the outside of the arm. It, my determination, this went up through the left cheek, out the right side of the top of the head. If it were a shotgun entrance wound, contact to the head. I don't care whether, there's no, there's no way his entire facial bones and skin, his ears would have been flopped down. There's so much gas expansion that the damage to his head would have been much worse. So that's based on my experience in, for doing this. And you know, I, I just don't know how, I didn't mention that styrofoam packing, but that's from when the pellets are coming in. And he said, oh, you can see they're going down. That's because he's looking from above. So he, but if you, if you look at where, the, where I believe and I determined by doing this autopsy that the entrance wound is, you, it's actually going up. So depend which side of the, of the pellets you're looking at. And if, uh, uh, just logically, if this was an exit, the pellets wouldn't have just stopped there. They've got a huge amount of energy. They're gonna continue through the arm and, um, and, and have individual pellets. They wouldn't have all just been concentrated right there. So, you know, we can use our powers of logic, which I think, you know, we all have, to, to understand how this is an entrance wound that exited the right side of the top of the head. Dr. Reamer, uh, having uh, specifically, uh, and you can take a seat now, thank you very much. Having uh, specifically addressed the specific criticisms uh, of the defense pathologist, uh, in your expert opinion, having actually done the autopsies in this case, is there any way that could have been a contact wound to the top of the head? No. All right. And having uh, addressed the specific concerns of the and testimony of the defense pathologist as it relates to Maggie, is your conclusion still uh, that um, the shot went in the direction as you described before this Yes, I, dis I disagree with his conclusions. All right, thank you very uh, much, Dr. Rimmer. Please answer any questions the defense counsel may have.
Dr. Reamer, good to see you again. Hello. So, um, you took pictures, correct? I took, I took pictures. I wish I took more pictures now, but I took I'm pictures. Sorry. I'm sorry. Would, yes, I would have. I wish I took more, even more pictures. So do we. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you made notes, which you converted into an autopsy yeah, report. Yeah, it's a standard operating procedure. Yeah, yeah, no, no. But so, um, and that's done so that somebody else can look at your work and see if they agree or disagree with you. Because uh, no, the notes are, are a work product for me while I'm preparing, doing my examination. I don't always, I, I take notes, I write numbers, but that is really for me so I can incorporate findings into an um, autopsy report that I'm going to write. And I don't write it the same while I'm at the table. I need to go away, maybe I'm going to do it the next day, that night. So, you know, but it's not done. You know, people say, oh, can I have a copy of the autopsy diagram? Well, these are not autopsy diagrams that are meant for other people to look at. And sometimes they're not even completely accurate because I mark things on the outside of the body that later on the, during the course of the autopsy, I determine, I'm like, oh, well, that's what that is. And it may not be what I initially wrote down. But by the time the autopsy's over, I've put it all together. And, and that a diagram or notes do not necessarily reflect everything, um, you know, that I concluded. Do you still have your notes in this case? Um, they, they, I imagine they would be in the file, but as I told you, this is, this is, my notes are not necessarily the conclusion that I came to. Did you produce them to the, to the, the state? I don't, I don't know what I did. I did. I personally, yeah, if they were asked for, I'm sure I did. Did you produce them to us? No, I don't think, I don't remember producing them at all. Um, I don't have a request for those notes in my file. But those notes would be your present sense impression as you're doing the autopsy, correct? Well, th they can have a lot of things written down on them. But we don't know because we didn't get them, right? Well, they're not important. What I, what's important is they're, they're my notes. They're for me. They're an aid to the pathologist. To So if even if I thought something initially, and then I after I, while I do the autopsy, um, by the time I get to the end, it could disagree. I don't necessarily go back and change the diagram. I'm not, it's my work product. It's for me to aid me in writing my autopsy report. It's not for public view. It's not a, it's not a, 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 a statement of my conclusions. Okay, um, did you review those notes before your testimony previously or today? No. Okay, so you just go with your report. Well, I, I reviewed my report, correct. Right, but you don't go back and look at your notes. No. Hmm. So uh, let me ask you some basic questions here. Um, you previously testified that the muzzle of the shotgun for this wound here that goes through his neck and out the top of his head was about three feet away. That would be about right. Okay. Now, um, you're familiar with this page from, I believe you've described it. Oh, yes, I've seen it many times. Okay. And as you see, the gas comes out, right, in the first shot, the top yes. shot. And then um, actually there's sort of a, a blowback of gas as the, um, as we can see right here, the projectile, which is the uh, pellets, are extruded from the barrel, right? I mean, there, there's, the gas pushes the pellets out. Well, there's gas expansion, and that helps propel the pellets. Yes. Okay. I agree with the book. This okay. was not a contact shotgun wound to the top of the head. Okay. Well, the book doesn't say that. But um, what the book does say is that as the, the pellets come out, at some point they begin to, the, 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 the container opens and the pellets um, expand or move out in a pattern, a circular pattern. It becomes bigger. Um, as the uh, the further away you get, correct? Yes, and that's what we have here. Okay. Where, okay. But this Mitch. is actually demonstrating specifically a contact 
shotgun wound to head. But we do have splaying outward of um, the pellets. We can see on the left shoulder, they're fairly clustered together because they're first starting to be released from the wadding. And they did spread out. We, can, we have some of them down in the neck, some of them in the brain, and so they are spreading out. I, I don't see how, you know, you're, yes, it's a respected treatise, but this is, is um, specific to a contact shotgun wound to have. This, this is? is what this is describing. Really? Well, it's fine. You know, it, it doesn't matter. I can look at my photos. I can look. If you're going to talk about theory, the doctor, photos. Doctor, Your, Your Honor, I'd ask you, I would to ask you to answer. tell the witness to be responsive. Um, she is going on a diatribe. Uh, excuse me. I'm asking the court to instruct her to answer the question as specifically as she can. She's she goes off on tangents, and, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. All right. All right, you may continue answering the question. You remember what the question was? No, that's your question. Is this series of shots from the book depicting a contact wound? I think I, that's what I understand. Yes. You, yes, okay. So where, if you step down here, show me, please, where the contact is with the body or the head. Here, let me give you this pointer. Well, the contact would be at the first area. Right here? Yes. Well, what's it contacting? It's not, it's just a theoretical um, depiction. It's a theoretical Is that depiction. what the book says? Yeah. Well, go ahead. I, I don't recall the exact, why don't you read it to me? Well, why don't you tell me, is that a contact wound? I don't know what this is. This is, this is, that's um, a shotgun. That's a shotgun. That's a shotgun being fired. Those are the pellets coming out. Object Those are the pellets. Yeah, I think, you know, this is, this is um, a book, you know, showing, um, showing um, the, 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 the series of steps after a shotgun is fired. If but it has nothing to do with what I found in the body and does not help me determine the direction of the wound. All right. So, and I'm not going to describe to you. You can read it in the book. I don't remember what how he says all of this. The what? book isn't testifying. You are. If you testified, that depicts a contact wound. Yes. Well, I, I, you know, I, I don't know what this is depicting. It could be that this is a contact wound. Um, I don't know where where you're going. With where, this. Well, I, where is I'm going? Is that in, that barrel in contact with anything? It's not in contact with anything. It looks like it's just blowing into the air. Okay, and you've been. That's fine. And your testimony is that barrel is at least three feet away from uh, Paul's shoulder. Is that correct? It, it could be, you know, depending on the weapon, it could be, uh, a pro it's not closer than two feet because we don't have the sibling. But we no do sibling. have packing material. Okay. So um, as we see here, these pellets are beginning to separate. Is it your testimony that those pellets had separated when they hit Paul's shoulder at all? Um, there is, um, there is, they are starting to separate. We don't have the complete, you know, widening of it. They're still relatively clustered together, but they're not as close as they would be if they were still contained within the widening. Okay, now, at two feet, is there any gas left, or is it all dissipated like this picture shows? Well, you know, what we have here, if there was more gas, if there was a contact wound to here, it's not a contact I understand. Wound. The gas, you know, you're, you're wanting me to say yes or no, and yes I can't no. because I have the, the knowledge to explain how this relates to examining the body. Okay, you know, so I don't give theoretical talks or, ex or, you know, I don't start looking up in this book while I'm doing an autopsy. I use my practical reasoning and my experience and knowledge of things. If, if there had been gas in the wound or when it hit his shoulder or his neck, would you expect to find some physical manifestation of that? Well, there would have been, um, you know, a, a lot more expansion, um, shoulder expansion. This, this was fairly contained on the So left you would, your testimony is there would have been little or no gas going to his shoulder to his neck. Well, there is always some gas, but it's not the kind of gas that we get in a contact shock. Exactly. So, um, and let me, you can go ahead and take the stand again, please.
sorry, I was going to take a minute to get. Um, no, not that one. Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, I have you go to the jury room for a break. Please do not discuss the case.